I'm Owen Bickline, this is the Inside Edge video blog. So you might have seen last week, it's been a busy week for me, I got into a bit of a dust up with the CMHC CEO, Evan Sindal. And I'll give you it in a nutshell kind of what happened and then I'm gonna kind of instill, uh, you know, my philosophies on real estate that I've been pounding home here for the past 10 years on my video blog and what I talk about in my book you know, the advantages of simply buying your principal residence and holding the damn thing for 20 or 30 years and you're gonna do fantastic. Take advantage of the leverage, don't over leverage. Pretty tough to do in, in a city like Vancouver where you're having to use conventional mortgages and go through all the hoops that you have to do to get qualified. Don't over leverage yourself. Uh, take advantage of the low interest rates we're currently enjoying. Take advantage of the principal resident exemption because the alternative is not fun. The alternative is to wade into the rental market in Vancouver, and that's not a fun place to be when you're paying $2,300, $2,400 a month for a one bedroom. And if you do the math on it, if you're a long-term renter in Vancouver, <laughs> indexed to inflation over the next 40 or 50 years, which is what you're gonna need a roof over your head for, you're probably gonna drop $1.5 million after tax. Do the math on what it's gonna cost you being a lifetime renter in a city like Vancouver. It's not a fun, it's an ugly picture. So I've always extolled the virtues, especially for young people, you cross a huge financial in life when you can save for the down payment, that's the tough part, get into your first place, into your principal residence, and then it's smooth sailing after that and keep it. It should always be looked at with a long-term horizon. I know I'm speaking to the converted here because I've been pounding this home for 10 years to my subscribers here, but. I'm doing this more for some new viewers here to set the record straight on what happened here with Mr. Sadal. But in a nutshell, I, I made a couple of innocent tweets because I often get people asking me about leverage, the power of leverage, how it works, etc. And I've addressed it many times on my blog here. But I gave a simple example of how leverage works. You buy a condo, let's say, in downtown Vancouver for 500K. You put 10% down. In three years, that condo was appreciated to 550. Let, you got lucky and it went up 550, let's say. Could also go down, as I'm gonna explain in a minute here. Some people would look at that and say, well, it's a, gone from five to 550, it's a 10% return. Well, in actuality, with 10% down, it's actually a 100% return. That's what leverage does. Now, it's a simple example I'm giving you here. Of course, there's property taxes and maintenance fees and a whole bunch of other things. It was just meant to be a simple example. Now. One thing I've learned with 10 years doing this video blog, and I think you guys, my loyal viewers here, know how I've always worked and what I've built my business on, and that is being ultra conservative. Ultra conservative and also painting both sides of the story. So in that same tweet, 10 seconds apart, I also did a preemptive tweet, knowing that people are gonna look at that talking about leverage and not talk about it going the other way. So I said in the other tweet, I said, people will say that leverage can go the other way, which it absolutely can. But you know, you're not a flipper or a speculator in this situation. You're buying a principal residence and you should be keeping this property for 20 to 30 years. Your home is not a stock. That was the tweet, covered both sides of how leverage works, simple enough. The tweet stayed out there for a couple of days, not much happened and then a couple days later, I wake up in the morning, my inbox is filled with, message, with emails, my text messages are off the hook. Turns out our HCMHC CEO, Evan Sindel, chimed in on my tweets. He did a 3 a.m. tweet barrage, uh, criticizing what I had said there, saying that here's a realtor who's doling out bad advice. There should be a law against a realtor telling people to buy their principal residence and hold it for 20 to 30 years. <laughs> I'm encouraging people to take on too much debt, over leverage themselves. He basically said, a few more personal attacks on me, basically said that I'm giving, it's like giving penny stock advice. So listen, I'm not gonna get into all back and forth here. I'm taking the high road on this like I always do. I uh, asked Mr. Sidell for an apology, thought the tweets had been taken out of context, as did most all the me major media outlets in Canada here. Thought it was highly unusual for the CEO of CMHC to be coming personally after me on a tweet about how leverage works and ma made sure that we include both sides of the equation here. It can work against you, but always have that long-term holding period. Don't over leverage yourself. You know, we talked, it just went on and on. He had multiple tweets about, Somebody putting down high ratio 5%, you're underwater after the, from the beginning, 
which you are because part of it is CMHC is charging you 4% for the default insurance. <laughs> but again, I don't think he took the time to even know, well, definitely not who I was or how I do business, how many years I've been in this business. Had no clue, I guess, about my book and the loyal following I have on my YouTube channel here and how I've always advocated a long-term holding when you're buying a principal residence, eight to 10 years minimum. Don't over leverage, but it's again, I don't think he knew I was from Vancouver. In Vancouver here, we don't use high ratio. My average sale here is over a million dollars. Even when I'm working some of the suburb areas, I'm privy to a lot of deals every year. Everybody pretty much, I can count on one hand the amount of high ratio I've dealt with in the last five years and none in Vancouver. So I'll give Mr. Siddell the benefit of the doubt here a little bit. I asked for an apology, I haven't heard back of course, but I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. It was 3 a.m., which I think was 6 a.m. his time. He's an early riser like me. Maybe he woke up on the wrong side of the bed and hadn't had his coffee yet. I don't know. One thing that I've developed on this blog is thick skin. I'm always getting pushback from people not agreeing with some of the things I say on here, and that's totally understandable. Not gonna, not gonna reach everybody. But let me just give you guys here the, in a nutshell for those viewers that have, aren't familiar with me, how I work, you can always go into the archives of my video blog. I've got close to 400 videos here over the last 10 years talking about the tangible benefits to owning your own home, how it's a huge hurdle in life. Eight to 10 year holding period minimum. Buy your principal residence, keep it. Because there is really no alternative in a city like Vancouver. And that's, I tweeted back Mr. Siddell and said, don't appreciate your comments there. I think they're a little off base, which everybody else did too. But I asked him, what exactly are you getting at here? What is your plan then for someone? And you notice I've talked about this before. People always are quick, quick to complain and look at the downside of things, of buying a home. It's overpriced. It's the realtors, the foreign buyers. <laughs> they always have an excuse. But what is the alternative? I've often said there isn't much. The alternative is to, they, they often think, act like there's some magic utopia out there in the rental world. That you can go, go out in Vancouver here and rent a condo cheap. The landlords are all great. You never have to move. It's far cheaper than owning. And that's not the case. You're paying $2,200, $2,300 a month here. As I often said, nothing wrong with renting short term. And renting until you can commit to a property. And the commitment is at least eight to 10 years, preferably longer. Or you have a backup plan, which is if you buy the condo or the home, you're f you have to move in two or three years, the market's down. The backup plan is to rent it for two or three years until the market recovers, which it always does, and then sell it. So you have to have a backup plan, but it's always, the, the beauty about real estate that I've been preaching for 30 years here is if you give it enough time, it's forgiving. We're never gonna be in some magic time where you can buy a home and it's gonna go up indefinitely forever. That's what you sign up for when you buy real estate or you invest your money in the stock market. You buy the right house, you buy the right stock, but it's not gonna go up in a straight line. That's what you sign up for to get superior returns. And again, it certainly beats becoming a lifetime renter. If you do the math on being a lifetime renter in a city like Vancouver, just renting a one bedroom condo at $2,300 a month today or $2,200 a month indexed for inflation, you're gonna be spending well over a million dollars, probably close to a million five over the next 40 years. And that's what your housing need is gonna be for 40 or 50 years until they take you to an old folks home. So that's what I've always advocated here on my blog. I know my loyal viewers know that. But I asked Mr. Siddell, what is he saying here? That people should just stay renting forever? Or he is calling for a 10 to 18% correction here. Should they time the market, wait for this correction, and then buy? You know, I own a lot of real estate. Should I sell all my real estate, pay the tax man, kick out all my tenants, and then wait for this correction you're predicting, and then buy back in at a cheaper price? He never got back to me on it, just like all the other people over the last 10 years that have come up with this exact same analogy that the market's overpriced, it's gonna go down, but they never have a plan. Timing markets is a mugs game. It's not gonna work out for you. So I would love to know what exactly the alternative is to owning your own home and keeping it. There isn't much. 
Again, nothing wrong with renting short term, but if you're going to stay and live in a city like Vancouver 30, 40 years or more, you should be a buyer. You should be an owner. Record low interest rates, take advantage of the leverage, don't over leverage, you got to put 20% down or more anyways. Take advantage of the principal residence exemption, which people never talk about. The only true tax shelter we get. You know, I saw a poll recently, Mr. Sedell must have missed this, had a poll of Canadians, asked them, after 20 years of home ownership, did anyone have any regrets? 88% said they had no regrets. I would go one step further if you asked, polled people in Vancouver here that have held a home for 30 or 40 years, did they have any regrets? It'll be nobody. <laughs> Best move they ever made. I have never met anyone in Vancouver in all my years in real estate here that has held a home, paid it off in full, clear title, who's had any regrets. However, I have met hundreds who have regretted not buying, staying on that renter treadmill, or selling too soon. One of the best decisions you can make is buy and hold your principal residence. End of story. Let me just finish off here with the fundamentals of what I've been pounding home here for years, for you, the new viewers here, just so you kind of understand where my philosophies are over the last 33 plus years. So just want to give some people some, some four points here that you have to understand here if you want to have any success moving forward, either retiring, <laughs> retiring early, which would be nice for a lot of people if you want, being financially stable into your 50s, 60s, or 70s. These are the things that you have to grab the bull by the horns on here and understand at a young age. If you don't, it's going to be very difficult for you. First one is you'll never save, you'll never earn and save your way to any type of financial success. You'll never earn or save your way to that. So earning, as I've often said there and why I wrote my book, Along for the Ride, it's about getting your money working for you passively. There are not enough working hours in the day for you to achieve any type of financial success. The tax, tax man is going to kill you here in Canada. I've often blogged about, you know, I'm in a 50% tax bracket pretty much. Revenue Canada takes half what I earn. And then taking those after, after tax earnings and saving them, putting them into a daily interest account or a high high uh, high interest savings account which last time i looked is paying about 20 basis points uh, or putting it into even a term deposit or a canada savings bond at one and a half percent that is a surefire way to uh, to failure Ta uh, in inflation's running at two and a half you're earning one percent on the term deposit it's taxed at your full marginal tax rate it's a guaranteed Guaranteed way to, to failure. Now, outside of an emergency fund, you should have an emergency fund. For me, it's one year. I keep about a year's worth of income uh, in an emergency fund. That emergency fund is just in a high interest savings account, which last time I looked is at 20 basis points. It's ridiculously low, but that's not what it's there for. It's there to be accessible. Ex financial experts will tell you three to six months you should have in just a, something that's accessible in a savings account. After that though, You've got to get your money working for you or you have no hope, zero. And I see these people on Twitter and these pundits that were agreeing with Mr. Sedell. They always look at the dark side of everything. Everything's overpriced. Everything's going to correct. Well, if that's you, then you're going to be stuck with fixed income and fixed income is going to leave you nowhere. You have to put your money into assets that can appreciate. Real estate and just buying a good index ETF, the S&P 500, down the road if you want to buy some good paying dividend stocks, even better. But you have to get comfortable to get those superior returns. It's not going to go up in a straight line. It would be wonderful if it did, if you could buy a house and it never went anywhere but up. Go back and watch my earlier blogs. I've talked so much about this. Half of the properties I've owned have been worth less than what I paid for them at some point. It's usually in the first four or five years. After that, you're above water permanently. Same thing in the stock market. Half the stocks and, and ETFs I pulled the trigger on are worth less than what I paid for them in the early run. You keep them long enough, it's a 40, 50 year plan anyways, you're gonna do fine. You have to realize this. Otherwise, life is gonna be very difficult for you. You're gonna end up putting your money in a coffee can or putting it in a bank account, which is gonna to guarantee to lose you money. This is so key that so many people miss. Leverage. Leverage magnifies your results. 
It can also go the wrong way on you. Use leverage wisely. Don't overdo leverage. Plain and simple. I've been pounding this home for years. Mr. Siddell obviously has no clue about my background, where I come from, or the kind of philosophies I've been teaching here on my blog or in my book. If he did, I don't think he ever would have made those tweets. Buy your principal residence, put 20 to 25% down, have a buffer, because the interest rates have got only one way to go from here, and that's up, and keep it. It will certainly beat renting. You know, there's that old analogy, let's go off track here, right? You know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, and I bought my first property 33 years ago, as you guys know, I still own it, and bought many along the way. You know, back then, interest rates were at 13, 14%. Well, you know what? Back then, that old analogy of save, or rent and save the difference, yeah, it might have worked. Because back then, you could rent a walk-up wood frame condo in the West End for $350 a month. Interest rates were at 14. For a few people, for a few people that had the discipline, yeah, there was some savings there that they could invest. Nowadays, it's not there. I wish Mr. Sedell would, would, would address this. How is renting better long term? Because now, that one bedroom condo in the West End is $2,200 a month. It's a tight rental market and has been for decades. And interest rates aren't 14%, they're at 2%. The tough part is getting the down payment. Once you're in and you're building up equity two ways, paying down the debt at ultra low interest rates, and you will get appreciation over time. Not every year. There's no guarantees. I've been in this business 33 years. My real estate portfolio has had great years and years where it's worth far less than what it was the year before. That's what you sign up for. Same thing in my stock portfolio. Talk about it in my book. I was down over a million dollars on paper in 08. Did I panic and sell? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, I was buying whatever I could, just like I was back in March and April during the COVID peak. You have to get comfortable with this. That's the thing that people need to get, get through here. There is no buy a home, buy a stock, save for investment, and it never goes down. If you want the superior returns, you have to get comfortable with that. But if you give it 30, 40, 50 years, which is what you're going to be looking at for retirement or for owning your principal residence, that takes much of the risk out of the equation. As a matter of fact, it takes all the risk out of the equation because in 22 years with an accelerated mortgage, it's paid off in full. Even if real estate stays flat for 20 years, you've got a fully paid off home there. The alternative, again, there's no utopia. The alternative is renting, paying a guy like me $2,200 a month with nothing to show for it. And that's why when you look at Canadians when they retire at 65 or 70, the biggest single asset they own is their home and why they have no regrets. For most Canadians, it's two or three times what their RSP is. And all the money goes to you tax-free when you sell it. Unlike an RRSP, that when you start to draw it out, the tax man comes calling. And if you supercharge your retirement like I have, you're not going to be in a lower tax bracket when you're 65. I'm still going to be in a 50% 50% tax bracket for life for me. So that's where we're at. No hard feelings with Mr. Siddell. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt he woke up on the wrong side of the bed. But I sure would like to know if he doesn't think that buying your principal residence, putting down 20%, sure, you're losing some leverage, keeping your home for 20, 30 years and not treating it like a stock, it's a roof over your head, how that is like equate, equate to penny stock advice. And what exactly is his plan? Give it to us. But none of these guys ever do. You guys know I've had many people on my blog over the years come out with these same kind of scenarios. And I ask them, well, give us your plan. What's your plan? Are you pre-approved? Do you have the down payment funds? What's your strike price? I've done so many blogs on this over the years, how people can't buy when the market's down. They won't. Because when the market does take a correction, starts going down, it's never the right time. They'll say, why would I buy now? The market's down 5%, but it's gonna go down 10 or 15. You never know where the bottom is on a market until you've missed it. You look back on it and that's where the bottom was 
three months late. You're always going to be a day late and a buck short on it. Why not just save for the, save for the down payment, get qualified, buy your first place, whether that's a studio or a one bedroom condo out in New Westminster and keep the damn thing. Move up the ladder down the road, build up the equity, move up to a two bedroom, or even eventually, if you can, a detached home. It'll be the best move you've ever made. And ignore these pundits that are continuously calling for corrections. It's never the right time. It's always doom and gloom. Leverage can go the wrong way on you. Don't, you know, you're, you're crazy to be borrowing any money. I guess, <laughs> this is a couple guys were saying on Twitter here, don't use any leverage then. Save your money until you have enough money to pay cash for your condo then. If you, if you feel, if you, if you don't want to take on any leverage and take out a mortgage, then good luck with that. So $700,000 to buy a one bedroom here now in Vancouver is my average sale, 675. I hope you're earning a lot of money because after tax, that might take you 20 or 25 years. Although the market's going to continue to go up as well. You might be 75 years old by the time you get enough cash to buy that condo. <laughs> good luck. It doesn't make any sense. And I know most of the people here are totally understanding what I'm putting down because a lot of you guys are longtime subscribers. You bought my book. Stay the course. I'm Owen Big Line. As always, thanks for watching. You know, I don't normally put this out there, but feel free to share this video if you want. Put it out on Twitter. The advantages of long term home ownership and why you should ignore a lot of this short term stuff because it doesn't mean anything. I'm Owen Big Len. I'll see you next week.